न्यूज व्यूज वॉइसेस ऑफ द ग्लोबल इंडियन कम्युनिटी इंडिया अब्रॉड सो वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट योर लेटेस्ट वर्क व्हेन शी मैरिड डॉक्टर पाटेकर um i want to know how did you conceive the idea about writing this collection of short stories and you know it touches everything like from childhood trauma to racism to empowerment so how do these themes intersect and why you chose to explore them in your stories okay so i chose to explore these in my stories because uh, uh you know as i said i moved to the us in 1999 and uh, that itself was a fairly intense experience for me uh, because where i first landed uh, which was in arizona uh, it was not a coastal city like san francisco or new york where there are a lot of diverse diaspora uh, from across the world as a matter of fact right so when you see so much diversity you acknowledge acknowledge your variation as part of just being but uh, when you come to a place like arizona uh, which was a fairly uniform in many ways and it is you know the, the amount of uh, indians that you got to see was very little there were a lot of indian students who were exactly like me but there weren't a lot of local indian residents in the area right so so to imagine what indians looked like live like in the us was therefore always a work of imagination for me that was one and the the feeling of isolation was fairly intense because as i mentioned in the book it is a time period where we don't have whatsapp calling which is at the press of a button you can connect with anybody in india this was still a time when as a student i had to buy a calling card which was a 5 dollar calling card promising let's say 30 minutes but when you scratch the pin code you only got 20 minutes as a matter of fact right so the, the connecting back home with india was so much more difficult that the feeling of being alone uh, kind of amplified and then mm. started making acute note of that feeling of being an immigrant um and that project went on and on for a while until um i thought that i had seen and then of course i graduated from school and then you know eventually uh, moved to another city i got married so i began to see a lot more diaspora in all its avatars and forms you know so that seed that had been planted literally almost it almost started on the first flight i took out of india which was the only flight i had ever sat in you know so from the novelty of the entire experience from flying literally flying away uh, from what you were always familiar with became a very uh, um, intense experience which i started noting down and then when i began to see as i said diaspora and all its avatar i knew that our experiences are so beautifully universal and yet there are nuances uh which uh, which are uh, touch you so you know i was like you know i wanted to write and i always wanted to write so i started to each story kind of takes off from one thing that was very um peculiar or uh, one thing that kind of caught my attention and then the whole narrative developed around it and so um, that is what brought this book into fruition Hmm. So, uh, um, how long did it take for you to, like you mentioned yesterday, that you know, it's it is never decided. Like you're a lot of times you're lost while working because you don't know the outcome. You're not necessarily working on a predetermined goal. So, how how long did it take for you to write this book? So, this book has been a long time in the making. and uh, as i said you know it covers the first 10 years of my existence in the us but also because i considered that time period fairly unique now that i look back at it right this was the mm. first 10 years when i said it's a pre whatsapp period it's a post 911 period and it mm. is a period where the y2k wave has just brought in a lot of it uh, immigrants indian immigrants you know these are young people and with them come their shaadi.com wives right so this is an interesting mix 
which is separate from the diaspora or from the Indian immigrants who had come earlier. And mm -hmm. so we have a lot of undocumented Indian immigrants here who work for literally minimum wage in, uh, you know, in uh, grocery stores, in restaurants and so on. There's them. And then there's this entire set of the doctors and engineers who came, right? But here is us at the Y2K way where we, there's a lot of youngsters who may not necessarily have all gone to IITs, right? Uh, they just went to an NIIT, right? And I don't want to say just, but I'm just saying that, that they took a one year computer degree and they got a visa to come here. And now they're like, you know, living a life here, which probably they always dreamed of. They, they managed to get a Shadi.com wife who also is similarly excited to come to a new country. But nonetheless, the truth remains that this is a country separated by geography and um, um, and time, literally time zone, right? And so when, when they come here, this, the isolation is there. Each of them has a journey to take, which is different from what anyone would imagine sitting back in India, right? So they come here and that is what then becomes the common strand so while there are the and there, and yet the stories are unfolding in a fairly universal form as in um i hear of a couple which is squabbling enough to be physically abusive so there's domestic violence there's police coming in and the police is instantly understanding it as a, a dowry case you know, so the police, the police just gives a nod. I understand, you know. So there are these stories that are coming out. And I realize that, you know, divorces happen everywhere. Perhaps domestic violence happens across the world. But these are nuances which are so personal to us as a diaspora, which were worth spending on, right? So that's when I sat down to kind of think of writing them. And so in terms of taking time, I started this whole journey writing these collective stories almost uh, in 2010-2011. Um, and uh, the first draft of majority of these stories was written at a time when I had two personal uh, you know, uh, life-changing kind of events. As in, I lost my mom and my second child was about to be born. Right. So, so in that time period between losing a mom and my new child coming into the world, uh, looking back, I never felt like I, I didn't ever think I was running out of time. But the way I wrote then, it almost feels like I was running out of time. So, you know, I wrote majority of these stories in the first draft form back then. Um, this is, again, uh, closer to 2010, 2011 time period. So it was all fresh in the mind. Um, and there was a lot of personal reflection going on, I think. And so I sat down to write all of these. But then, of course, life took on and I never got back to these. They were lying there all this time. And then post-pandemic, when I took a like a long, deep breath, having worked very extensively in the pandemic, because every I'm a teacher by profession. So, you know, everything went virtual. And there was just so much work to do with kids at home, also virtual, me teaching virtual, all the meetings, everything became so intense that once the pandemic officially ended, I kind of put everything on the side. And I really said, I want to take a deep breath and get into doing what I really, really want to do. And that's when the story, you know, I went about the editing process and went through multiple rounds of that. And here we are. So how long did it take? One could say it took me a lifetime to write these books. Uh, and at the same time, one could say that these were written in a dash. They were written in a dash. And, you know, emotions that come in them come, came in a dash. Huh. On female protagonists, like why, why emphasis on women, their voices? Why, uh, you know, it's because um a lot of times one may think it could be because you know feminism ki ideology you know it has come forward and everybody is like talking about it women are marching the streets women are doing this this they have a voice of their own but 
going given the fact that it, it's taken so many years like it was that period of time you know at that time when you were writing that book i don't think um bahut zyada uh, emphasis thi fem- feminism ke upar at that point ye to over a period of time grow hua hai but uh, us time pe utna nahi tha to why female representation or maybe you were thinking ahead of time or maybe you thought that this is because you also belong to a family where there are so many you know there are, it's women dominated so <clears throat> maybe that was one of the things at the back of your mind so why female representation is what i what i want to understand so uh, so, uh, the majority of my protagonists are women uh, because <laughs> i mean again i i never sit down to write because i want to deliberately write about one cause or anything but mm. something triggers right and mm. then i mm. begin to write and then i over you know as i as i keep writing i try to be a more responsible writer in mm. uh, in in being able to uh, portray and project uh, women or any other entity in the light that i would like them to be received in the world mm. right and therefore mm. as i said that you know i try to keep away from women being victims in my stories mm. not because i yeah. think women are not victims women are women i mean we we still have a long way to do to go in terms of women being treated with the kind of humanity that they deserve mm. but because i want my stories at the end uh to also um uh, you know be able to shed a greater level of empathy on any um uh, cause or matter right but having said that the 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 women in my stories are there very organically they were never planted there for the sake of because they are women um uh, it is their story uh, so if i'm talking about the title story when she married dr patikar you know i will take the liberty of putting it on record but my muse for the story my inspiration for the story was our famous bollywood diva madhuri dikshit right um and the reason was again because i was i have over years uh, felt that it was such a big decision on the part of someone who was living such a royal royally um um perceivable you know the perception was royalty i don't know if her actual life there was because i don't know if she was truly very uh, you know uh, tired of the paparazzi following her and all that right so but i imagine that journey for her, that you know she was tired of paparazzi she really wanted a life which was more normal and therefore she comes to america with this doctor uh, because she finds so much solace and anonymity that the doctor provides right so she comes here but then again she will she is stunned by how fickle her fame was she really wasn't prepared for the kind of isolation that she was thrust into uh, with this relocation and in mm. that, i was able to kind of you know uh, uh use part of my own experiences of isolation right and so 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 her story then became it is her story i mean that was she it had to be her story right so even though the title of my book is dr patikar shines as the guy you will realize in reading the story he's always a shadow it is her story it is her taking that physical labor which she was so used to in the non stop dancing routines that she did in her bollywood life that physical rigor that she has a sturdy muscle that she now plants into a race right so uh, in this story in the title story she comes out victorious through a long distance running which for me was you know like almost like showing that she ran so fast she ran so much that she had developed that muscle and she's an intelligent human being to transplant that talent of hers to something to kind of anchor her to america so she runs a long distance and she she wins it in her own way without any medal but she wins it in her own way and says here i am i will write 
right so it is a story of uh, uh, accomplishment it is a story of how bollywood could trivialize women but their the, the muscle that they develop is nothing trivial it is a strong one it allows them to uh, sprout wings anywhere in the world, right so that we keep so that story again so similarly i think the women in my stories are there very organically and therefore i'm very proud of the fact that but there are women but there are also men in my stories hmm. right so uh, uh, there is a story of an a young it uh, engineer who comes here he's a youngster he's very happy he's full of uh, you know exuberance he's just fallen in love with a uh, with a brunette with a white brunette you know she works with him and it's very natural for people to fall in love he's just fallen in love and then he becomes a victim of a hate crime this is post 9/11 right so he becomes a victim of a hate crime where obviously it's not um, uh, you know it's not a, a fatal attack but nonetheless he's really stunned by this right and so that's where the interplay of like you know you could be living a very ordinary life but suddenly you're made to realize you're an immigrant right so mm-hmm. it's like that uh, and that is a very that is a, that is atul's voice atul is the protagonist mm-hmm. there. Yeah. That is totally his, <clears throat> and I give him, you know, credit, and I'm happy that you know I feel very. Uh, I felt that the voice came out very authentically. I really liked what came out of it. Likewise, there's a colonel story, who's being asked to migrate to the U.S. by his only child, uh, mm-hmm. but the colonel resists, uh, not because of patriotism. If one might, one might want to say that to him, and there is a sentence, there's a conversation in the book where one of his peers age peers says you know oh so that's because you you know you were a colonel so you must be very patriotic and he's like you know that's at this age i don't care for what passport i'm holding on to right mm-hmm. what i care for is where i am in terms of my memories my comfort level my familiarity right so that story is about how uh how the whole world glorifies america as the land where everybody wants to go to migrate to but here is an old man for whom this migration holds no such glory for him at this age and time what matters is is being with what is familiar to him right so the contrasting journeys of migrants uh, i was able to put and therefore while there are women there are also men um and you know all of them come about organically to me uh, but mm-hmm. as i said once i have introduced a character i really try to be very authentic to them uh, portray them in the in the light that they would ideally uh, but i don't want to leave them fully as victims though there is one story in my book which refers to child abuse you know and child abuse uh, slash like you know the, so basically how the concept of the family in india sometimes gets muddied and you know in this amorphous web of people around us uh, uh, sometimes elements enter who can take advantage of situations right so in one story i have a young uh, kid a girl who is thus a uh, kind of abused by a re- by an uncle in the family uh, over multiple years and and then time passes by and she migrates to the us where she's very keenly aware of what would be the definition of family because she's so detached now from that entire setup she has the she has the will and the tools to literally Uh, define who will be family in america she is not meeting random people randomly all the time so for her daughter she sits down to actually define this is what family means to us this is it everybody else is mr joshi and mrs uh, pant and so on there is no uncle in our life in that way right so that story goes on and you know Uh, some friends have come back saying that they felt that this person uh, uh she was left kind of unempowered in the way that she never went back to her uncle to kind of take revenge but you know that uh, and and so while it feels like that 
I feel that not everything can have a tangible revenge and happy ending in life. And since it doesn't, we redefine the way we can, uh, what we can. So in that story, yeah. yeah. Revenge is a very, it's very subjective. It's very, it's, it, it also differs from person to person. Some people uh, are not um, vindictive per se. Some people completely, it, it just reorganizes their life. The very. way they, uh, their outlook probably. How they see things, how they view things. And maybe for them, revenge is that not wanting something similar to happen to their own child or their clan and their clan, you know. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, I see culture, I see identity, um, and and I see a very interesting mix of, you know, belonging, sense of belonging. All of these are there in your book, and the book, you know, smoothly navigates through all of these in the environment. So have you personally experienced um, challenges with these entities, with these particular aspects in your life as an, as an immigrant? So, so I'm fortunate enough to have never experienced them. And I'll say why, because I think I came with a great sense of empowerment. You know, so I never kind of, for me, it, uh, I, the empowerment was that, um, you know, I'm here to study. I'm not here to take anybody's uh, job, which is not rightly mine, you know. So everything that I, at least that's what I felt in my mind when I came here. Uh, since I earned my right to come here, I came here on a full scholarship. You know, I never felt like, and so I was fully empowered in that way. And therefore, when I went, it is so, people have so many times tell me, you're living in a fool's paradise to imagine that, you know, there is no uh, bias or while discrimination and prejudices are very strong terms, but people, but people around me use them often enough that I feel, am I actually like an ostrich with my head, you know, uh, buried uh, and I'm not seeing something. So that changes, that changes for me now when I have children going into the system. Uh, they are part of the system. They are every bit American. Um, and yet when they step out, they are also... Uh, different from a majority of people around them they look mm -hmm. so for mm -hmm. them whenever if they ever come back to me mm -hmm. that they felt one way or the other that's when it becomes personal to me right uh however again being a uh, being almost optimistic uh we've kind of brushed that aside for them We've never let them, uh, you know, kind of dwell on that topic long enough to internalize it because this is their karma bhumi, right? Hmm. They have to navigate this with as much sense of ownership and entitlement. That, hmm. So at least at home, we try very hard never to let them feel anything else. But hmm. this is where you... This is what you will do. This is your country and you have to work hard for it. You are entitled to every bit of promise and privilege that this country has. And if it goes down the drain, you are responsible for it too. Right? So you have that sense of completeness and hmm. hope that they therefore are able to fight off any such identity uh, prejudices. Uh, that is our part. So that's where I have become sensitized to that idea, having never personally felt it per se. You know, at most where I have felt is not even along the lines of um, identity or race. It is more along gender. You know, so uh, twice in my entire experience here, I have had a colleague say something which to my gender radar felt very, uh, you know, odd. And I am happy to say that one time I was able to snap back. And I'm very sad to say that one time I was not able to. As in, I just let it pass. 
I didn't retort. And looking back, I can realize that I was a much younger person when the first incident happened and I was not in a position where I felt, you know, I should immediately retort and I kind of just kept it to myself. Like, you know, I was like, okay, let it pass. Let's not blow. It was nothing big. It was just a statement. But in this version of me would never do it, right? However, when the second incident happened, I was a much older person and I felt far more empowered. Um, and I had the right vocabulary too. And I was immediately able to say that, you know, I don't think you should be saying this at all. I hope you know that if I were to even report this mildly, there's so much waiting for you right here. You know, so just telling them, being familiar with the law, being familiar with what's out there and just reporting it back to them helped me a lot in those uh, in this latter situation. Uh, so I think, as I said again, Oh, I've never uh, felt, uh, you know, being looked at differently because I am an Indian, I'm a brown, uh, but gender, as I said, two times I felt like, oh, this was coming because of my gender, uh, but that's about it. And listening to uh, a conversation by uh, Konkana Sen uh, Sharma and uh, just it, it is slightly offbeat but uh, so she, she said that you know in this industry the entertainment entertainment industry is never so like fair fair because there could be instances where people are like extremely talented but they don't get the due credit of their talent and people could be like just good for nothing, just very mediocre actors and privileged actors. Um, but they're getting a lot of, uh, you know, fame and limelight and spotlight and, you know, getting all the good movies, good parts. Mm -hmm. Just to have that knowledge empowered me to not expect too much from this industry when I entered this industry. Now, when you talk about your it's, it's slightly offbeat but the context is very much similar just that knowledge just that understanding of how it's going to be maybe you know sort of helped you or helped her in that in that regard to bear be bear the you know the the difficulties the challenges of the place or the situation or the location so you know manvi i feel that konkona saying that certainly makes sense because I mean it is what it is in terms hmm. of uh, you know uh, you're out there on the screen right yeah. and uh, so um, it is the, I really don't want one of us you me or my children to settle with this idea that you know oh there'll always be biases and nepotism and so on and therefore I sh I'm okay to settle for a secondary situation um, hmm. I don't think any one of us should be internalizing this sentiment. Yes, there hmm. will be biases, but yes, I will I will try every level to see to it that I get what I feel is due to me. Yeah. Right? So I am yeah. settled with the idea that, you know, and I kid you not, I mean, by God's grace, I have a uh, part because as i said my father right my father my sisters they've always given me that sense of uh you know you belong and you work for it and you will get it and you should get it when you work for it right that sense that i have always felt that you know uh that if i worked for it i don't think i should be settling for anything less um hmm. You know, and, and it, it therefore it really enables me to focus on what I work on. And I know there are times when I haven't worked and I haven't got what I dreamt of getting. But that's hmm. all. I, at least I have that accountability within myself. Hmm. Right. And likewise, therefore, for you too, if you know you have put in the work, you should certainly never settle. And this is the same for my daughters too that you should yeah. not settle just because you know oh because you know they are of course like you know they are them they are not mm. them. you are no less mm. and uh, mm. that's something we really have to constantly internalize as women this is the only sentiment we need to internalize that you know mm. 
if we deserve it we will get it we should get it and if we're not getting hmm. let us question why hmm so uh, what kind of conversations do you even though we've like repeatedly talked about these things in each of our questions that we've focused on each of the aspects that we focused on but at a broader level uh what kind of conversations do you want this book to you know <clears throat> uh come up with uh, at a broader level at a community level uh what what kind of conversations do you want to encourage what dialogue do you want to encourage with this book with with your work okay so um i've had a couple of uh, book events with this book and mm. uh, it has been largely <laughs> attended by a lot of diaspora and then some right so mm. in the diaspora what i've seen is that they have um okay one second nidhi i'll just put in the charger uh, mera na battery chala jayega aap continue karo aap bolte raho because ye record ho raha hai okay <clears throat> yeah so the diaspora has largely uh, taken this book as a uh, you know they have kind of um, uh, identified with with the book in the form of the various nuances of diaspora that this book covers that's one number 2 this is a book about uh immigrants uh trying to make life in new places and therefore it is about how new places uh uh interact with humanity and human beings um and so this is not just about international immigrants it is about anyone who stepping out of the familiar you know a place where you've grown up you have family you have relationships and then you detach from all of this uh, and move out to strike a place uh, to strike a uh, to make a home in a newer place um, all the newness that comes with it and then if you add a layer of like you know it's a new marriage or uh, it's a new relationship or it's a new job so you have an entirely new set of colleagues and bosses and expectations to manage so i think newness is something that is universal so to say that these are immigrant stories is correct but to say that these are only immigrant stories is incorrect these are stories about life taking you to new places you meeting with new challenges and how do you navigate with the particularities that come with your identity so this could be a white american uh you know relocating from uh lubbock texas which is in the middle of nowhere as they say coming to new york city to work it would be just as dazzling baffling to them as it would be for an indian back in my time migrating to america right so it is not so much about only that there is this uh, cultural difference because of us being from the eastern hemisphere coming to the western hemisphere it is about cultural difference because when we live in certain uh, certain smaller geographies that we do uh, we become part of a cultural fabric which is different from when we relocate to other places so newness is something that is universal the other conversation i want to have is uh as you mentioned there are women protagonists in the story and they all have different uh journeys in a way right so there is new marriages there is age there is ageism in a story um uh, there is um, um there is a story about uh you know uh, uh some mental uh, problem or a depression scenario right so th- these are various nuances which i hope that people will realize that real human beings are made up of these kind of scenarios and we need to have a sense of empathy when we look at a person that they're all going through their own story and you should not take them for what comes to you at that particular uh, gps location right so at this point this is what you see of them let's not be uh, let's not be 
you know, let's not jump to conclusions and let's not have judgments and biases just because this is the interface we had with them. Because each of us is going through a narrative, a story in our back background, which is forming us. So in making stories, right, as opposed to one big novel, this also then becomes about the fact that there are so many ways in which lives are playing out constantly um, that we need to have a sense of uh, adventure, empathy, kindness, and love towards each other. And then lastly, uh, you mentioned my bilingualism. Um, and as each of these stories I have laced with a share or a kavita in Hindi, Hindustani language. And uh, that was a uh, that was not so much just a conscious decision on my part, but it was also a very natural decision. As in, I am a bilingual writer and thinker. Right. So for each of these stories, uh, uh, particularly when uh, diaspora reads it, uh, they'll they'll find the ending uh, stories, uh, the ending couplets, uh, fairly uh, catchy. But they'll also they are also a representation of the fact that we immigrants are blessed with bilingualism. You know, we are blessed to think in two languages. We are blessed to be able to code language in our different languages. So between my children and I, if we are out and if I need to be angry with them without calling, uh, without having the whole world look at us, I will just yell something to them in Hindi, right? Um, and most of the world around us would not have understood, whereas my children would have immediately been disciplined, right? So that luxury of bilingualism is something that I think uh, we immigrants must celebrate. Uh, we must really enjoy and we must cherish it, you know, nurture it to the best of our possibility. And that's what I do in the stories too, that each of the story ends with a couplet from, you know, kind of which ca captures a lingering thought about the story. So, for example, the story on, and I'll just read to you so that, uh, you know, so the story on Patekar, uh, it ends with the... Uh, uh, because it is about the fickleness of her, um, of the fame. It says, Bina praja ke raja bhi kaha raja rahega. Bina praja ke raja bhi kaha raja rahega. Tanha jazire mein mujhe kaun raja kahega. And jazira is an island, right? So she is here and she was a raja, but she's no longer one because you need people to call you raja more than anything else, right? So you don't have those people. And um, that's that's that. And then similarly, uh, for um, I'll, I'll just quickly read one more to you, which is about uh, Sarla, uh, the person who had, uh, um, you know, who was victimized as a youngster, right? And so she comes here in the name of an uncle. There is this person. Mm. So uh, her ending poem is, Koi ajnabi garwar karta, to me ek bar marta. Koi ajnabi garwar karta, to me ek bar marta. Wojo dost ne and hire me kia hivar. Me tarpabhi hu, marabhi hu, hazar bar. Right? Mm. So it is the, it is, the, and, and you know, for very often for these children of these kinds who are abused when they are so small. Mm. It's possible that they don't even realize it at that time, what they were going hmm. through. Uh, it is when they grow up and they realize that a normal child and a normal uncle behave in this way, but hmm. that's what happened to me. They could then relive and re-suffer throughout the years, right? And through hmm. and so it is that, that, you know, it leaves you with that sense of victimization, which is lingering and can continue right so uh, that's uh, that's the ending of that and similarly then each of these is uh, accompanied by a hindustani kavita or a know, couplet. A couplet. Yeah. so uh <clears throat> that how uh, do you approach a subject and then does data comes into play 
um, <clears throat> does economics come into play? Now let's reverse the question. And my last question to you is that when you go teach, uh, does writing come into play? Does your interest in literature come into play? Because these are two different fields and some way these are connected and some way you have connected them and they play an integral part of your life. <clears throat> So kya aapke, uh, you know, why you teach, does all of this come forward and you mix it up and you make it an interesting case for your students? So while I never actively discuss literature with my economics class, and rightly so, because that's not what they're in there for. Yeah. I feel as a person with literature as my uh, huge, you know, uh, background story, um, I certainly have a very... A uh, very nuanced um, interaction with my students. I am, I'm a. I think I'm. I'm more of a human than just you know an authoritative teacher <laughs> who comes into class and teaches them on data and math and so on, right? So I do, uh, you know, besides interspersing my class with, uh, you know, humor as and when I can, I also try to understand their story. And I am blessed to have a lot of uh, bilingual students. I also have a lot of first generation college going students. I have students who are working uh, full time and then taking classes on the side. So they have their own struggles. I can understand them. I feel I might not have been so uh, open to understanding them if I wasn't myself a person immersed in reading and writing human behavior through literature right so mm. i go to them with a more open uh, you know i want to, i want them to talk about their experiences and of course i bring an economic perspective in their uh, uh, scenarios so and we talk about climate change often uh, through economics as an experience uh, but i would say and this probably would be true for anybody because i uh, very uh, i very consciously migrate to literature either in the form of a writer or a reader i am more empathetic than i would have been if it weren't so if i was not resorting to literature as much and therefore i want to say uh, the last word would be that literature just makes us all better humans and i i want to go on a limb on that and say i bet you that it does mm. So. Mm.